Hello there, I'm Carol Lehan. Welcome to Sunday to Sunday. Father Larry Rice joins me today. Father Rice is a Paulist priest who lives in Washington, D.C. The Sunday to Sunday players will proclaim the gospel. This Sunday, we continue reading from the Gospel of Luke. Then Maggie Linton will tell us about the prophet Habakkuk on Bible background. And Martha Reyes will bring our program to a close with the hymn prayer, I Will Praise Him. That's what we have lined up for you on this edition of Sunday to Sunday on this 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time, 2001. Today we hear from the prophet Habakkuk, one of the little known books of the Hebrew scriptures. And our reading can be divided into two parts. In the first half, the prophet directly addresses God. In the second part, Habakkuk reports the response he received from Yahweh. How long shall I cry for help, O Lord? With these words, the prophet cries out to God in the midst of his frustration. He sees violence, misery, and oppression all around him, and he turns to God for help. Although it might appear that he is complaining, Habakkuk is really acknowledging his human limitations and the divine power. One does not turn to God if one did not implicitly or explicitly trust that God, in fact, will intervene to comfort and console. Today, Habakkuk's example of trusting in God at all times is an example that is worthy of our imitation. You'll find the reading in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 2 to 3 and chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. In our second reading, St. Paul offers words of wisdom that can speak to us even as we read them centuries later. For in these brief verses, Paul appeals to Timothy to persevere in the face of hardship and to renew his zeal for the Lord. Timothy is encouraged not to be ashamed of the gospel and to bear his share of suffering for the gospel's sake. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit. This is the heart of Paul's message. Timothy and you and I have been entrusted with a great gift. It is the mystery of our faith and new life in Christ that empowers us to love one another and to endure hardships and trials. Paul's words were a source of encouragement to Timothy and they can be for us as well. You can read those verses in the second letter of Timothy, chapter one, verses six to eight and 13 to 14. And you'll find the final reading in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 5 to 10. After everyone in your group has read those verses, share your thoughts on today's theme. We'll be back here when you're ready. Hello, Father Rice. It's good to have you with us this week. Thank you, Carol. It's good to be here, as always. We continue to read from Luke's Gospel this week. What can you tell us about this week's reading? Our Gospel this week echoes themes from the first and second readings. There are two separate sayings of the Lord in this passage, but the message draws on one theme. For this, in, in this instruction, Jesus is reminding his apostles of the power and the necessity of faith. Whenever the Gospel writers record a conversation between Jesus and his disciples, there's always an interesting twist. Would you agree? Absolutely, Carol. We see this happen repeatedly in the Gospel accounts of Jesus and his relationship with his disciples. Typically, the disciples pose a question to Jesus, and he responds to them with a series of teachings. But what makes it so interesting is that Jesus' response usually involves a total shift in perspective the disciples are challenged to expand their often limited and narrow visions and embrace Jesus' liberating message. How does this story illustrate your point? Well, to begin with, the disciples ask Jesus to increase their faith. They are focused on the amount of faith they possess, and Jesus invites them to reflect on the nature of faith. The disciples are concerned about the quantity of faith, and Jesus draws their attention instead to the quality of faith. He wants them and us to reflect on the quality of our faith in God. Why does Jesus use the image of a mustard seed and a mulberry tree? Well, we've seen this technique time and time again in the Gospels. Jesus doesn't present his disciples and us with these lofty 
philosophical concepts. Instead, he draws on concrete life experience, images and metaphors for our spiritual lives. The mustard seed was considered one of the smallest seeds, and the mulberry tree, on the other hand, is difficult to uproot since its root system runs very deep. Jesus is using this image to illustrate how very little faith is needed to accomplish great things. Okay, finally, Jesus uses a parable at the end of his instruction. Is the message of the parable connected to the theme of faith? Yes, indeed. The parable of the servant and the master's expectations is another metaphor for our faith in God. Jesus is teaching his disciples and us about the obligations and duties of the servant. Like that servant, we've been called to serve God in faith by using the gifts and talents we've been given. Rather than dwell on our great accomplishments, we are to rejoice that we've been privileged to serve God, the source of every good gift and blessing in our lives. Thanks, Father Rice. As you think about the importance of faith in our lives as Christians, listen and watch the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim the gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be rooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your servant who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here immediately and take your place at table? Would he not rather say to him, prepare something for me to eat, put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink? You may eat and drink when I am finished. Is he grateful to that servant because he did what was commanded? So should it be with you. When you have done all you have been commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what we were obliged to do. Father Rice has some reflections on the Bible and you. Thanks, Carol. The Bible is truly a timeless book, and it never ceases to amaze me that words written two to 4,000 years ago can still speak to us in the 21st century. This is a book that contains the history of our salvation, which is the record of God's dealing with humanity, and it presents concrete and tangible instructions for living. And while it's true that there are volumes of scripture commentaries and interpretations, Ultimately, each one of us has to hear God's word personally in the depths of our hearts and minds. Then we seek to translate that divine word into action in our own unique spiritual journeys. Today's gospel opens with an intriguing request made by the disciples of Jesus when they say, Lord, increase our faith. And in some ways, all of us have at one time or another prayed this prayer when we're faced with moments of doubt or anxiety and the daily stresses of life's challenges, we wish that we had more faith to see us through. Most of us have prayed in the silence of our hearts, Lord, increase my faith. In one sense, praying for more faith is half the battle won because we're acknowledging our human limitations. Instead of relying on our own strength and ability, we choose to entrust ourselves to God in faith. And although through the lens of faith we begin to see things, they're in a new way. Faith in God gives us a new perspective so that the situations and people that cause us anxiety and difficulty and stress become the very place in which we can encounter the loving presence of God. But it is only with the eyes of faith that this transformation can happen. Jesus' teaching in today's gospel reminds us that faith is not to be measured by the number of spiritual activities we're engaged in on a given day or week. It's not a matter of how much I do in my spiritual life. Rather, faith is measured in the kind of persons we become. What is God making of me? Is my faith in God transforming me into a peaceful, loving, and compassionate person? Am I more attentive to the needs of the marginalized, the weak, and the weary? 
Faith in God empowers me to transcend my needs and to look for ways to serve others. I began today by saying that the Bible is a record of the history of salvation offered by God to all. On the other hand, the Bible is also the record of humanity's response to God. It shows us the incredible things that can happen when we place our faith and trust in God. And this is where you and I come into the picture because the scriptures are not just a record of the past. The story of salvation history continues in the here and now. It continues each time you and I pray these words, Lord, increase my faith. For only then do we truly become part of that ongoing stream of the divine story of the world's salvation. Thank you. It's time for your discussion, and we have some discussion starters for you. First, how do the words of the prophet Habakkuk speak to you this week? Secondly, how does St. Paul's words encourage you to witness to your faith? And a third, how often do you pray for an increase of faith? I hope these starters are a help to your discussion. When you finish with it, come back to the tape. Maggie Linton will share some of her thoughts with us. Maggie Linton joins us now on Bible Background with some interesting information on the little-known prophet Habakkuk. Prophets are never very easy to understand, and Habakkuk is no exception. First, little is known of him except to speculate that he was perhaps a member, more than likely a leader of the temple choir. But temple chanting was not Habakkuk's style. He was a deep thinker and a man of much literary skill. In fact, he was a wrestler with God. Like most of us, he was intrigued with the question of evil. Scholars tell us that the evil people Habakkuk speaks of might have been the Jewish people themselves, but we know that they are also the Babylonians because it was during Habakkuk's time that Babylon was taking over the Near East from the fallen Assyrians. While we don't know very much about Habakkuk, Scholars are able to tell us that his prophecy occurred sometime between the defeat of Nebuchadnezzar at Carchemish in 605 and the siege of Jerusalem in 597. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. It's your turn to go first this week on the question, what is God calling me to do this week? Well, Carol, as I've been thinking about this whole balance between the quantity of faith and the quality of faith, um, part of what this raises for me is something that I suspect a lot of priests hear from people, and that is that people will often come up to us, they certainly come up to me, and, and ask us to pray for them or to pray for something they're concerned about, and then they'll often say, because you're better at this than I am, or because you're closer to God than I am, or you're better at praying than I am. And every time I hear that from somebody, I mean, I understand where it comes from, but it just makes me itch because I want to turn around to them and say, you know, this isn't about who's better at this. You know, you are capable of praying here. Um, and I, I try to respond compassionately to people in that situation because they're expressing a very genuine need. And the struggle for me is in the midst of that, uh, you know, because I, I could be, you know, kind of hard-nosed and try and call them to some responsibility here for their own lives. But that's not the point in that situation because I think they're saying the same thing as the disciples are saying in the gospel. They're saying, you know, Lord, give me more faith. I don't have enough to do this mm -hmm. on my own. So for me, the challenge this week is to hear that a little differently from people and not necessarily to, uh, to react the way that I sometimes do, you know, because I, I want people to believe that they are capable of praying and I'm not any more capable of that than they are. But at the same time, it's, it's people saying, Lord, give me more faith. And to try and hear that in a different way is going to be a challenge for me this week. 
there's a a discipline partly in uh, in praying. Yeah. That might be a weird thing to say, but in just spending the time, like uh, this past summer, my mother would seek out places and say this you know I feel <laughs> she wouldn't say I would feel at one here <laughs> anything, you know but she would just find a space where you know she gets the ocean or she's near trees and and she just focus on she's really wonderful but <laughs> she'd, she'd focus on a person and she'd image that person and then she would you know send good thoughts to that person, and then she just talked to God about that person. Mm -hmm. And when she would share her prayer with me, it's just living it. But, and for her, it's not so much of a discipline, or not all the time, you know what I mean? She, she will wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and get out her prayer list, which yeah. is a very extensive, <laughs> and just spend time on each person. You know, she's pretty well memorized or <laughs> just how she, but I don't have that discipline, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that um, I admired in watching her. It's a, but it's an increase my faith. Like, boy, I admire what she has. But I'm going to go over here, and I've got some other things to do right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But she was a great, uh, is a great example of um, of one who has taken on a discipline of prayer, and. It is part of her life. Yeah, it doesn't. You know, it, it doesn't seem like a discipline in the sense of something that she has to, you know, put in her schedule yes. each day. It just arises organically from the exactly. situation she finds herself in. That's a real That's grace. A, it is, and uh, people use me as an intermediary to ask her uh -huh. to pray for the. <laughs> it's a little I bizarre understand. twist. So I, I got what you were talking about too. <laughs> well, Father Rice and I have discussed God's call. It's time for you to do the same. When you've completed that brief discussion, come back to the tape for a closing prayer. We've heard the words of our gospel reading and we've reflected on its message. Now join me in listening to Martha Reyes as she raises her voice to sing, I will praise him. Tú eres mi roca fuerte, tú eres mi roca firme, tú eres mi roca salvación Tú eres mi roca fuerte Tú eres mi roca firme Tú eres mi roca y mi Dios Yo te alabo con fidelidad Yo te alabo con integridad Yo te alabo con sinceridad y amor Yo te alabo con fidelidad, yo te alabo con integridad, yo te alabo con sinceridad y amor. You, you are my solid rock, you, you are my only Lord, you, you are my only song I sing. I will praise you with all my faith. I will offer all you request and more. You, you are my son. You are my only Lord. You, you are the only 
praise you with all my heart. I will praise you with all my life. I will give you my heart's desire, my soul. I will praise you with all my strength. I will praise you with all my faith. I will offer all you request and more. I will praise you with all my heart. I will praise you with all my life. I will give you my heart's desire, my soul. Thanks for sharing God's Word with us today. We've just completed another edition of Sunday to Sunday. Next week, Tony Marinelli will be with us as we reflect on the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So be sure to join us. Till then, for all the folks at Paulist Media Works, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye. Hello there, I'm Carol Lehan. Welcome to Sunday to Sunday. Tony Marinelli is with us. Tony is a pastoral minister at St. Patrick's Parish, Huntington, New York. The Sunday to Sunday players will proclaim the gospel. This Sunday we read from the Gospel of Luke. Then Maggie Linton will tell us about Samaria and Samaritans on Bible background. And the choir of St. Augustine's will bring our program to a close with a hymn prayer, Look What God Can Do. That's what we have lined up for you on this edition of Sunday to Sunday on this 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time, 2001. The main character in this week's first reading is Naaman, whom the ancient Israelites would have considered a foreigner. He is cured of leprosy, and this event becomes the cause of his conversion to the God of Israel. It is a moving story of a conversion, and it prepares us to read the gospel account in which Jesus cures a group of ten lepers. In ancient Israel, the term leprosy covered a variety of skin ailments and diseases, and Jewish law had several regulations to govern the actions of those suffering from leprosy. In this miracle, the waters of the Jordan transformed Naaman's diseased skin into that of a child the miracle cure is a turning point in Naaman's life. Having experienced God's power in this personal and physical way, he proclaims that there is no other God but Yahweh. God's love knows no boundaries, for both the Israelites and the non-Israelites can experience his healing power. You'll find the reading in the second book of Kings, chapter 5, verses 14 to 17. This week we continue St. Paul's exhortation to Timothy begun in last week's second reading. In these verses, Paul exhorts Timothy to remember the central message of the gospel. It is a twofold message. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and Jesus is a descendant of David, the one who fulfilled the longings of Israel. Then Paul goes on to speak of his own suffering for the sake of the gospel. The fact that Paul is writing from prison gives his words a greater urgency for he sees his sufferings as a participation in the sufferings of Jesus. Finally, 
Paul exhorts Timothy to faithfulness to God. He points to the ultimate paradox of our spiritual lives. If we are unfaithful, God remains faithful to us. This is mystery of divine love that is offered to each one of us, even today. You can read those verses in the second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. And you'll find the final reading in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. After everyone in your group has read those verses, share your thoughts on today's theme. We'll be back here when you're ready. Tony Marinelli joins me. Welcome, Tony. Hello, Carol. We read today about the cleansing of ten lepers and the grateful Samaritan leper. Can you give us some background on leprosy? Why were lepers considered such outcasts in ancient Israel? Well, that's a good question, but I don't think I know the answer to Why that not? one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, the Bible really says very little about the nature of the disease. It says only that lepers were never to live in the towns and villages, and that they were always shout out when they were approached. Uh, and they couldn't visit synagogues or temples either. It was only when they'd been cleansed of their leprosy that they could present themselves to the priests in the temple. One thing we do know, uh, scholars are convinced that whatever the disease was, it wasn't what we call uh, leprosy today. Its effects were not only physical, but social and religious. They were totally ostracized, weren't that, they? That's right, uh, and, and that's why Really, they're so crucial to the gospel message. Uh, more than any of the evangelists, Luke portrays Jesus as the friends of those who are rejected in the eyes of man. So these lepers represent the lost and forgotten and abandoned. And I guess the Samaritan leper is suffering a, a double whammy. He's both a leper and a Samaritan. It's hard to say which was worse. Yeah, it, that's right. Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They had intermarried with pagans. They built their own temple apart from Mount Zion. This story sounds almost like a parable. I, I think that's a good point. I, I, think, I think it's a good guess that Luke has probably taken some poetic license in retelling this event. For him, the moral of the story is clearly the key. The gospel ends with Jesus telling the man to go. Your faith has been your salvation. That sort of sums up the point of the story, doesn't it? It does. This section of Luke's Gospel is all about the nature of faith and salvation. Two weeks ago, we read about the rich man and Lazarus, and we saw that salvation means putting love into action. The rich man did not, and he missed his salvation. Last week, we saw that faith means being useless servants who are only doing their job. And this week expands on that theme, like the grateful leper our lives are meant to give glory and praise to God in and through Christ. Thanks, Tony. As you think about the importance of gratitude to God, listen and watch the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim the gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. As Jesus continued his journey to Jerusalem, he traveled through Samaria and Galilee. As he was entering a village, 10 lepers met him. They stood at a distance from him and raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. As they were going, they were cleansed. And one of them, realizing he had been healed, returned, glorifying God in a loud voice. And he fell at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus said in reply, Ten were cleansed, were they not? Where are the other nine? Has none but this foreigner returned to give thanks to God? Then he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has saved you. Tony has some reflections on the story of Jesus and the ten lepers. Thanks, Carol. The story of Jesus and the ten lepers has two different layers of meaning to me. On the one hand, 
It's about crying out to Jesus for mercy. And on the other hand, it's about reaching out to those who are most isolated and alienated in our society and world. Now, my first impulse is to feel sorry for these poor lepers who are cut off from daily life. But then I recognize that in the story, these lepers are supposed to be me. As Jesus came by, they were supposed to be screaming out, unclean, unclean. Instead, they called out for mercy and for help. So first and foremost, these lepers' lives are transformed when they reach out to Christ. I suppose those lepers are a part of me that has the good sense to realize that my life is much better off when I reach out, when I invite Christ into its heart and center. These lepers remind me that Christ is a healer of hearts and minds and souls and psyches, as well as leprous skin. He's supposed to stay away from the lepers. Instead, he draws close. So this week, we pray for the grace to invite Christ into those leprous spots in our own souls and not to be afraid of those leprous spots and to face them. Secondly, if Jesus reaches out to those lepers, then it is the responsibility of his disciples in every age to do the same. As a society, who do we place outside our care and concern? Who would we rather not see or hear from? Is it not the mentally ill and the elderly disabled? Like the lepers in the gospel, the sick elderly remind us of who we don't want to be. And too often we hide them in institutions and hand them over to the care of others alone. For the past four years, I've had the unique privilege of visiting an elderly aunt in a nursing home each week. She really had no one else to come to see her. And each week my son would join me. And in the course of our visits, we came to know many people within that home. And we came to know the women who cared for them. My aunt, Mary Marr, in all honesty, was not a unique or special person. She had no exceptional gifts or even any great wit or charm. She was just an ordinary human being. And she was always very, very grateful when my son and I would walk into the room and spend a couple of hours and share a meal with her. And when this 88-year-old woman finally went to God, my son wept like a baby. So let me brag a little bit about my boy. He's an all-star pitcher. He's a great little basketball player. He was even his class's chess champion this year. But I will always remember that for four years, this little boy freely chose to come with me to visit those who had no visitors. So Lord, this week, open our ears and our hearts to hear the call for mercy from those who are cut off and alone. Help us to find your presence in their midst. Thank you. It's time for your discussion, and we have some discussion starters for you. First, how does your parish welcome newcomers and strangers into the community? Secondly, how does Paul's words to Timothy speak to you personally? And a third, what is the place of gratitude in your life of prayer? I hope these starters are a help to your discussion. When you finish with it, come back to the tape. Maggie Linton will share some of her thoughts with us.
Now let's hear Maggie Linton on Bible background as she shares some interesting thoughts on Samaria and Samaritans. Northern Ireland is a place of intense hatred between two religious groups. That hatred is lived out every day in bombings and gunfire that kill and cripple hundreds of people in a year. The hatred in Northern Ireland is not unlike the hatred that took place thousands of years ago in a region known as Samaria. A long time before Jesus, there were two kingdoms in Israel. Samaria was one name for the Northern Kingdom, and Judah was the name of the Southern Kingdom. Samaria and Judah were always fierce political rivals, but the crowning blow in the dispute came when the Assyrians invaded Samaria, deported most of the leaders, priests, and scholars of the kingdom, and brought in many pagan people to live amongst the Samaritans. The Samaritans eventually intermarried with the pagan people and so developed their own form of Judaism based mainly on the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures. They also adopted a number of the pagan beliefs and worship practices. Needless to say, that made Samaritans anathema to other Hebrew people who maintained the ancient forms of the Hebrew religion. Understanding the early history of the Samaritans helps us to understand why people in Jesus' time were so shocked when he would speak to Samaritans, share a cup of water with them, or even help them with his healing power. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. It's your turn to go first this week on the question, what is God calling me to do this week? I was thinking of the, the lepers and uh, reaching out. And I was sharing that story about my aunt and my son. And for four years, that's been such an important part of our lives that on, on one level, I don't want that to end as an experience, mm -hmm. even though uh, May is gone. Um, and so what I was thinking, I, I live about a mile down the road from a hospital. And uh, one thing I do fairly well is bring books to life. And um, so maybe I'll pull up some Harry Potter books and, and head down to the, uh, the children's ward and, and see if Matt will join me. And, uh, That's a great idea. Money. Yeah. That is a great idea. Yeah. I, I might steal that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not for this week. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, I'm thinking here at the beginning of a new school year that there are always students who come in who kind of have to break in to the society. Yeah. Not so much lepers, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a very point. privileged school. Uh -huh. but, um, but I guess uh, on any level, there are stratas, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and uh, there might be a way that we can organize a kind of a mentorship mm. um, so that they're like upperclassmen who maybe adopt a new person. I don't have to think about it. And I'll do that this week. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Good luck. Tony and I have discussed God's call. It's time for you to do the same. When you've completed that brief discussion, come back to the tape for a closing prayer. We've heard the words of our gospel reading and we've reflected on its message. Now join me in listening to the beautiful voices of the choir of St. Augustine's as they bring our program to a close by singing, Look What God Can Do.
Thanks for sharing God's Word with us today. We've just completed another edition of Sunday to Sunday. Next week, Father Rice will be with us as we reflect on the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So be sure to join us. Till then, for all the folks at Paulist Media Works, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye. Hello there, I'm Carol Lehan. Welcome to Sunday to Sunday. Father Larry Rice joins me today. Father Rice is a Paulist priest who lives in Washington, D.C. The Sunday to Sunday players will proclaim the gospel. This Sunday we read from the Gospel of Luke. Then Maggie Linton will tell us about justice and judgment on Bible background. And the Resurrection Choir will bring our program to a close with a hymn prayer, Te Alabo. That's what we have lined up for you on this edition of Sunday to Sunday on this 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time, 2001. The passage selected for our first reading is taken from the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus. In it, we read of the dramatic story of the Israelites' battle with Amalek. The account of the battle is meant to demonstrate once again the favored status of the Israelite nation. The Amalekites were a group of nomadic tribes that inhabited the region of Sinai and the surrounding wilderness. 
the Old Testament records, records a long and bitter enmity between the nation of Israel and the Amalekites. It is in that context that the account we read today can be better understood. In the days of ancient Israel, nations usually went to war over the necessities of life. This particular battle was probably fought over water or pastures for the animals, both of which were precious commodities in the desert. The Israelites believed that God was on their side as they battled for survival. You'll find this story in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 8 to 13. For those of us who gather each week around the table of God's Word as members of this Sunday to Sunday family, our second reading is particularly appropriate, for in this passage from the second letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul speaks of the importance of the Scriptures. All Scripture, writes St. Paul, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, correction, and for training in righteousness. Then Paul invites Timothy to remain faithful to the word of God that he has known since his childhood. Finally, Paul urges his fellow Christians to proclaim God's word even though it may lead to suffering. As we continue to search the scriptures for daily wisdom, these words of Paul to Timothy are a timely encouragement. You'll find that passage in the second letter of Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 to chapter 4, verse 2. And you'll find the final reading in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. After everyone in your group has read those verses, share your thoughts on today's theme. We'll be back here when you're ready. Hello, Father Rice. Welcome back. Thank you, Carol. I'm glad to be here. We have yet another parable in today's Gospel reading from Luke. What's the main message that Jesus is conveying in this story? Well, Carol, only two Sundays ago we read the story of the unjust steward. And this week we have a variation of that story in the parable of the unjust judge. Jesus is once again drawing a sharp contrast between the two characters in the story, the unjust judge and the widow who pleads for justice. How would you characterize the difference between these two characters? Well, let's take a look at the judge first. Luke describes him as having no fear of God or of human beings. This is not a pretty picture by any means because fear of God was considered to be a basic characteristic of a good person. The judge himself admits that he lacks devotion to God or to his neighbor. But worst of all is the fact that he fails to ensure that justice is served to everyone. Don't you think that's a contradiction? Isn't the job of a judge to secure justice? Well, it is, Carol, of course. The judge's task in any society is to make sure that every person is given justice. So yes, the judge is living in a contradiction. Moreover, he's especially required to give justice to the most vulnerable and the weak and the poor. And this would include the widow, right? Exactly, Carol. The widow is the one who stands in clear contrast to the unjust judge. But although she's defenseless and vulnerable, she's got a great deal of courage and perseverance. She's already the victim of some injustice, and yet she goes before the judge to plead for a hearing. The judge is indifferent to her, but this doesn't diminish her persistence. He may not give in to her, but she doesn't give up. So in the end, the judge finally gives in. The judge gives in, but only after the widow has persisted in her requests. And Jesus uses her as an example of the disciples' need for constant prayer. We can't know when our prayers will be answered. What we do know is that we are to persevere in prayer. God will answer our prayers in God's own time. What's left to us to do is to continue to daily offer our petitions in faith and in trust. Thanks, Father Rice. As you think about persistence in prayer, Listen and watch the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim the gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable about the necessity for them to pray always without becoming weary. There was a judge in a certain town who neither feared God nor respected any human being. And a widow in that town used to come to him and say, 
Render a just decision for me against my adversary. For a long time, the judge was unwilling. But eventually, he thought, while it is true that I neither fear God nor respect any human being, because this widow keeps bothering me, I shall deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. Pay attention to what the dishonest judge says. Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Father Rice has some reflections on the Bible and you. Thanks, Carol. The central figure of this week's gospel story is the courageous woman who will not give up. Through her example, she teaches us a powerful lesson for our spiritual lives. And as we meditate on this passage, we are given some very practical insights into the nature of Christian prayer itself. Today, we live in an age of technology. The world has indeed become a global village because of new and faster means of communications. My own daily work at Paulus Media Works involves me in the use of internet technologies at the service of the gospel as we create and design websites for church organizations and dioceses, among other things. It's still amazing to think that modern communications technologies has given us access to vast resources of information in relatively short periods of time. Now we can send and receive email from family, friends, and coworkers literally in a matter of minutes. This rapid flow of information was unthinkable just a few years ago. Now the benefits of these new and faster means of communication seem limitless. Whatever one's spirituality, ultimately the prayer of a Christian is a form of communication with God. And as we communicate with God in prayer, we often anticipate quick results and answers. Sometimes we expect our prayers to work at the speed of modern internet technology. We want instant messages from God, and we lose hope easily when we feel as though our prayers are not answered immediately. The Gospels present us with a somewhat different understanding of prayer. The widow is relentless in her pursuit of justice. She wears the judge down, but eventually gains a just verdict in her case. She's not discouraged by the judge's lack of interest, but perseveres in her request. And so it must be with us when we place our needs and petitions before God. As we come before God in daily moments of prayer and petition, we should not expect God to move at the speed of light or the speed of the internet. Instead, we are to see prayer as a means of deepening our relationship with God. In other words, the real purpose of prayer is to change our hearts and minds, not God's. In this, this week's gospel, it's the woman who is persistent. In reality, it is God who is the persistent one. God tirelessly seeks after us even when we turn away from God. In the words of the English poet Francis Thompson, God is truly the hound of heaven. The Gospels show us time and time again that prayer is the means by which we grow in our union with God. It is not a means to receive instant communication. Authentic prayer changes our hearts and our minds and our attitudes over a lifetime. May our reflection on this gospel story today lead each one of us to persevere in communion with a God whose love and mercy for us is relentless. Thank you. It's time for your discussion, and we have some discussion starters for you. First, what form of prayer do you use most frequently? Secondly, how can you deepen your life of prayer? And a third, what role does God's word play in your life? I hope these starters are a help to your discussion. When you've finished with it, come back to the tape. Maggie Linton will share some of her thoughts with us.
Reflecting themes in today's readings, Maggie Linton joins us now on Bible Background with her thoughts on justice and judgment. Jesus Christ, teacher or traitor? Robespierre, saintly citizen or scoundrel? Ali North, hero or criminal? Justice and judgment have always been an intriguing element of how society functions. So it might be interesting to know how the early Israelites dispensed justice. Before the Israelites had a king, crime and contract disputes were settled either by the head of the family or the head of the tribe. It was Abraham who gave Sarah the power to get rid of her rival, Hagar, in their family dispute. In the book of Ruth, Boaz, a town elder, called together a legal assembly of elderly men. They sat at the gates of the city and judged the claims of Ruth. The decisions of the elders were based on custom and tradition. The trial relied more on the testimony of witnesses than on written documents. During the time of judges, war commanders like Gideon had the power to make legal judgments. And when the kings began to rule Israel, the power of judgment passed to them. So we hear about the wisdom that King Solomon brought to his court. But even the kings never made laws for the entire nation of Israel. The law came from God. So difficult cases were taken not to the king, but to the priest. In Jesus' trial then, we hear of the Sanhedrin, a group of ordained scholars who acted much like a Supreme Court. The high priest presided over this assembly. Because of the Roman rule over Israel, judgments at this time were frequently more political than just. Even the Sanhedrin was dissolved by the fourth century as religious and humanitarian judgments gave way to civil authority. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. It's time to ask the question, what is God calling me to do this week? And I think uh, <laughs> it's prayer. <laughs> okay. you know, I don't know where else to go there. Uh, I have to make some decisions about things. Okay. And, uh, and I can make lists and analyze. And you know what? <laughs> doesn't get you there, does it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that is really the guidance. Right there. I mean, I you know I can get very left brain about mm -hmm. my my good and my bad list, <laughs> you know. But I I think that maybe I've uh, omitted <laughs> a major step here, and um, that just hit me over the head this week. <laughs> okay. So so how do you do that this coming week? I think that uh, that in contemplation about some of these choices that I need to make, that that I offer that up. Um, to if I need to make, if I don't have a decision by the end of the week, right? That's that's the in my time thing. Then maybe ambivalence is key. Mm. To I don't have the answer, so maybe the answer is no. Okay. Well, I hope that that prayer brings you the resolution that you're looking for. <laughs> resolution would be not ambivalent. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's not a big thing. Yeah, I don't know. But the idea of being at peace with the answer not being clear. Um, might, might be part of it. I, I don't know. Okay. Well, I mean, because part of what you were saying is that uh, it's not always in our time. Yeah. Right. So you have to uh, offer that up to whatever, that he'll use whatever poor decisions we, <laughs> yeah. that we make, right, and learn and, and grow in that process. Sure. How about you? What do you want to do this week? Well, I think that what what hits me this week and something that I'm going to have to spend some time reflecting on is what exactly persistence means. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in this gospel, uh, the the woman is persistent with this judge, but uh, elsewhere in the gospels, Jesus says it's not just repetition of prayers that's not going to do it. So there's there's something more being asked of me this week in terms of persistence, and. I'm still kind of sorting this out in my head, but I think that the additional piece is an, an openness, in a sense, that, that persistence in prayer requires not just that you keep doing it, but that you know, I have to keep myself open to however that prayer changes me. 
And that's a different kind of persistence than simply repeating the same prayer over and over again. Uh -huh. And uh, you mean like, and I want prayer? <laughs> well, uh, maybe. But even even other kinds of prayer that I find myself simply repeating, uh, maybe what I'm being called to do is to to be persistent in a different way, not just persistent in terms of repetition of the same prayer, but with an openness that will allow me to be changed by that prayer and by God's grace through that. Um, that's a different kind of persistence, I think, than, than simply saying the same thing over and over again. It's the, it's the willingness to open myself to whatever God has for me in response to my prayer. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, it does, and I'm taking it in. Okay. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Father Rice and I have discussed God's call. It's time for you to do the same. When you've completed that brief discussion, come back to the tape for a closing prayer. We've heard the words of our gospel reading and we've reflected on its message. Now join me in listening to the Resurrection Choir as they bring our program to a close with a hymn, Te Alabo.
Thanks for sharing God's Word with us today. We've just completed another edition of Sunday to Sunday. Next week, Tony Marinelli will be with us as we reflect on the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So be sure to join us. Till then, for all the folks at Paulist Media Works, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye. Hello there, I'm Carol Lehan. Welcome to Sunday to Sunday. Tony Marinelli is with us. Tony is the head of the religion department of Holy Trinity High School, New York. The Sunday to Sunday players will proclaim the gospel. This Sunday we read from the Gospel of Luke. Then Maggie Linton will tell us about Solomon's Temple on Bible background. And the Paulus choristers will bring our program to a close with a hymn prayer, Beloved, let us love one another. That's what we have lined up for you on this edition of Sunday to Sunday on this 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time, 2001. The words of Sirach convey a double message in this week's first reading. For this is a discourse on the impartiality of God and the prayer of those in need. Sirach is part of the wisdom tradition of ancient Israel and in it are contained teachings on many concrete and practical issues of life. Jewish wisdom literature consistently maintained that upright living will be rewarded and the sinfulness of the unjust will be punished. Today we speak of the preferential option for the poor. And as we read these verses from Sirach, we recognize its roots in the Jewish wisdom tradition. God favors those who are less fortunate particularly the orphaned and the widows who represent the poorest of the poor. God is concerned with justice, not with favoritism. And we who follow in the ways of God are encouraged to do the same. You'll find the reading in the book of Sirach, chapter 35, verses 12 to 14 and 16 to 18. In the concluding chapter of St. Paul's letter to Timothy, we read his farewell message to the Christian community. Paul is acutely aware that his days are numbered and that his martyrdom is imminent. As a follower of Christ, however, he is not disturbed or resentful. In fact, he eagerly awaits the end when he will be united with the Lord. Finally, Paul contrasts the faithfulness of God with human unreliability. His companions and friends have deserted him in his hour of need. In spite of these adversities, Paul relies on God's strength. You can read those verses in the second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 to 8, and 16 to 18. And you'll find the final reading in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. After everyone in your group has read those verses, share your thoughts on today's theme. We'll be back here when you're ready. Tony Marinelli joins me. Welcome, Tony. Hi, Carol. 
This week we have one of those great little stories that Jesus told about the people and places of his time. We meet a Pharisee and a tax collector at the temple. I love this parable. There's, there's not a wasted word in it. The people would have known these characters well. The Pharisees were devout religious men who kept the strictest obedience to the Torah. And Jesus often engaged them in debate. Tax collectors were the lowest of the low. They worked for the despised Romans. We find them in the temple. Is the setting important to the story? Very much so. The temple in Jerusalem is the dwelling place of God. What we will see are these two men as they stand before God. And what we see is a shock. The tax collector is the one who is justified in the eyes of God, but not the Pharisee. That's right. The Pharisees and tax collectors are often foils for each other throughout the gospel. Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees are outraged by it. In today's story, we see into their souls. We also see their bodies. Jesus says that the Pharisee prayed with head unbowed, and the tax collector dared not to raise his eyes to heaven. That's a good. <laughs> that's that's right. That's a good point, and and that's a. Jesus, I think, does well with that. Not only do their words reveal their hearts, but their bodies do as well. It's it's their posture before God that is the issue here. Now the Pharisee does all the right things for all the wrong reasons, and the tax collector has the sense to know that he's a sinner dependent on God's mercy. I think of the difference between the appearance and the reality when I read this story. People are not necessarily what they appear to be, and that is true for both the Pharisee and the tax collector. That's right, and we could certainly connect that to the world in which we live. There are many people who honestly believe that the appearance is the reality. You know, celebrity worship certainly would seem to fall into that category. But Jesus invites us once again into the soul where our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Thanks, Tony. Let's listen and watch the Sunday to Sunday players proclaim the gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Two people went up to the temple area to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself. Oh God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity, greedy, adulterous, dishonest, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and pay tithes on all that I get. But the tax collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed. Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, it was the latter who went home justified, not the former. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Tony has some reflections on today's gospel. Thanks, Carol. If Jesus were alive today, what would he be doing? I think that's an interesting and provocative question. And the answer would probably tell us a great deal about the way that the person understands Jesus or what they focus in on in the life of Jesus. I've asked that question to many students over the years, and I've gotten all kinds of answers. He'd be working with AIDS patients. He'd be a TV preacher. He would be a homeless person. He'd be a doctor. Recently, one of my students suggested that he would be making movies like Steven Spielberg. He said that Jesus was an awesome storyteller. And the way that people tell stories today is through the movies. I thought it was a fascinating answer, and today's gospel reminded me of it. When Jesus walked the earth, there was no television or radio, newspapers or movies. The art of communicating was through the spoken word, and usually to small groups. Great teachers like Jesus spoke in a way that people could remember their words. And to do that, there's nothing better than a story. If I'm trying to explain an idea in class, it's not uncommon to watch eyeballs glaze over. But when I tell a story, I almost always have their attention. Human beings love stories. We identify with stories. We enter into stories. One of the characteristics of Jesus' stories is that they usually have a twist to them. 
They're kind of like Hitchcock. They're unpredictable. And they stand conventional wisdom on its head. Jesus loved to use his stories to peel off human labels on people and ask us to look with a divine eye. They love to peel away human stupidity and greed and selfishness and invite us to see people for who they really are. And that's certainly the case today. There's a Pharisee and a tax collector, and the Pharisees are devout and educated and religious, and the tax collectors were the scum of the earth. They worked for the Romans, and they stole money from their own people. But Jesus invites us to peel away the labels, he invites us to see the people. And this Pharisee has fallen madly in love with his own religious piety, and his inner self is self-determined by how others see him. He's pious and good and devout. This is how he is seen in his own eyes and in the eyes of others. And he believes in the eyes of God. Guess again. The tax collector is disdained by others, but justified in the eyes of God. And Jesus peels away the labels. Now, in the church today, there are some labels that sometimes do more damage than good, that's for sure. Two of the ones that I'm thinking of are the labels of conservative and liberal. Too often we climb behind one of those labels. We hide behind it. Some people like to apply the word conservative to mean legalistic or backward or unenlightened. They like to imagine themselves as the home of enlightened thinking and compassion and gospel values. While there are others in the church like to label some people as liberal, meaning that they're soft-headed as well as soft-hearted, and they lack the strength of character and personal integrity. If today's gospel, if today's story is any indication, I think that Jesus would like us to peel off those labels and see what's underneath. And I think we'll find that both conservatives and liberals can be like the Pharisee in the story sometimes, infinitely proud of their own goodness and contemptuous of those who think differently. And I think we can find other conservatives and liberals who are like the tax collector, profoundly aware of their limitations, dependent on God's mercy and grace. This week in the Gospel, we meet Jesus, the storyteller, who invites us to connect our stories with his story. And the Pharisee and the tax collector are a part of every community. In fact, they're probably both a part of me. Are they a part of you? Lord, this week we pray for the grace to see people with new eyes, to let go of labels and prejudice and judgment and our sense of superiority. Thank you. It's time for your discussion, and we have some discussion starters for you. First, why are labels we put on people so destructive? Secondly, how are you called to imitate the example of St. Paul? And a third, how would you define humility? I hope these starters are a help to your discussion when you've finished with it. Come back to the tape. Maggie Linton will share some of her thoughts with us. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we often read of Solomon's Temple. Now Maggie Linton joins us on Bible Background with more information on Solomon's Temple. Even though Jerusalem is about 90 miles from Jesus' home, it is the site of the best-known temple of the Scriptures. According to the Bible, Solomon built the Temple of Jerusalem on the site that was selected and paid for by David. The site has been occupied ever since and is now occupied by the Mosque of Omar and the so-called Dome of the Rock. It's quite certain that the temple faced the east and that the huge rock now enclosed in the dome was part of its structure. More than likely, the rock was actually the foundation of the Holy of Holies. It took seven years to build the temple. When it was completed, its interior was divided into three major sections. The section that is highlighted on your screen right now seems to have been the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, 
and you can probably guess that it was called the Holy of Holies for that reason. Near or on the top of the ark were two gold-plated wooden cherubim, winged animals whose extended wings reached from wall to wall. The angelic figures rose halfway to the ceiling. Even though the ancient Jewish people were poor, it seemed as though they did all they could to enhance the temple in which they worshiped their God. For Bible Background, I'm Maggie Linton. It's time to ask the question, what is God calling me to do this week? Now this might seem a little bizarre, I'm but sure when I, I'm sure it will. I, I've held on to something, I'm 41, and I've held on to something during the Mass, uh, which I guess irritated me when I was young, and uh, so I wouldn't participate in this way. At the end, the priest says, bow your head oh, and yeah. pray for God's blessing. And I would, I would be listening to people around me and go, they're not thinking about what they're saying, they're just mumble jumbo, you know, they're just uh -huh. doing this mantra, right. <laughs> you know, they're not thinking about it, so all of a sudden they're gonna start praying and that and they know that because they're bowing their heads see this is you hear the the teenager in me right now absolutely i'm going to work on that this week <laughs> <laughs> i i wouldn't i would not bow my head because why it was part pharisee and part tax collector because i because it would no it was really all pharisee um <laughs> because it just felt um like all of a sudden it was something that we were imposing as a community. We're suddenly going to bow and we're suddenly going to pray when we should have been praying the whole time. So if you weren't praying the whole time, don't bow your head. That's the way I thought of it. <laughs> I'm going to work on that this week. Yeah. <laughs> For 41 years, this has been pent up inside of you. <laughs> I'm glad you're coming to grips with it. <laughs> you're really horrible. <laughs> well, I think I just really have to spend time with it. Uh -huh. Because <laughs> there, there was a certain amount of understanding my vast weaknesses to be able to say I'm not going to insult God by suddenly bowing my head uh -huh. as if <laughs> so this is not like I'm not going to bow my head for the priest is it that's not part of it is it no, no. it was and uh, now pray for God's yeah, blessing yeah, I and I should yeah, okay. it was like now I'm oh, glad know. you got all that out thank that's, you that's thank you it's yeah. a cathartic experience well, I'm going to give up to that yeah I pray that I'm like the tax collector. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and what are you going to do this well, week? Well, nothing Something quite as, as deeply rooted in my <laughs> psyche as that. What I was thinking of is uh, the labels, you know, and um, getting beyond the labels. And um, the kids, you know, as, as, as the year moves on, the way to get beyond labels is to get to know people for who they really are. And it's so easy when you teach in a Catholic high school, as I do, to put labels on kids because they come in wearing masks and persona of who they want you to think they are, you know. Um, and to actually get underneath those personas is, uh, you know, takes, takes reaching out to them, um, takes, you know, seeing them in the hall and stopping to chat and, or sitting down seeing them in the cafeteria and sitting to chat or after school and taking some time. Um, because the persona, the mask that they wear in a classroom is very often, is a, literally a mask of who they want you to think them to be, whether it's this cute, pretty kid or this real smart person or this deep thinker or whatever. So I'm going to see if I can maybe uh, take some time to get underneath some of the uh, the masks that the kids wear. And I don't think that's just Catholic school, though. No, it's right? not. No, of course it's not. Yeah. It's, I've experienced it's, that, too. That's right. It's, it's every school. It's every kid, yeah. Okay. Tony and I have discussed God's call. It's time for you to do the same. When you've completed that brief discussion, come back to the tape for a closing prayer.
We've heard the words of our gospel reading and we've reflected on its message. Now join me in listening to the Paulist choristers as they bring our program to a close with a hymn, Beloved, Let Us Love One Another. Thanks for sharing God's Word with us today. We've just completed another edition of Sunday to Sunday. Next week, Father Rice will be with us as we reflect on the 31st Sunday in Ordinary Time. So be sure to join us. Till then, for all the folks at Paulist Media Works, I'm Carol Lehan. Bye.